Well, good evening, everybody. Thank you all for coming down tonight. We are live from Books and Books in Coral Gables, Florida, so a note to our internet audience watching at home. If at any time during the presentation you'd like to purchase a copy of tonight's book, you can just call the number on your screen. We'll take care of that for you. We'll get it signed, and we'll ship it to wherever you are in the United States free of charge. Also a note for you Books and Books fans out there, please note that we have a new location in the Carnival Tower of the Adrienne Arsht Center for the Performing Arts. We have a beautiful new restaurant and bookstore down there, so please visit Books and Books at the Arsht. So this evening, Books and Books is very happy to welcome back our friend, New York Times bestselling author James Grappando, presenting his latest thriller, Cain and Abe. Mr. Grappando lives right here in South Florida. He was a trial lawyer for 12 years before the appearance of his debut novel, The Pardon, in 1994. This is his 22nd novel. In it, Miami's top prosecutor becomes a prime suspect in his wife's disappearance, which may have a chilling connection to the woman he can't forget. Uh, James's thrillers get great reviews, as you know. I've got a couple of quotes here. This is from Linda Fairstein. She says, Cain and Abe is a stunning thriller. Think Gone Girl meets Grisham. Then, <laughs> then throw in shocking twists and turns that will keep you on the edge as you race to the end. And US News and World Report simply says, Grappando has been at the top of the legal thriller ladder for some time. Tonight, as a special thank you, if you purchase a copy of Cain and Abe, James will give you a complimentary copy of the paperback of your choice, any of his paperbacks, that is, not <laughs> any of ours. So please give a very warm welcome to our friend, Mr. James Grappando. Thank you, uh, and thank you all for coming out on a, on a, on a Wednesday night. Um, and uh, it's always great to be here at Books and Books. My friend Mitchell Kaplan uh, introduced me 20 years ago uh, when I <coughs> launched, um, launched The Pardon. Um, I had an interview with uh, Huffington Post, and uh, when you've done something for 20 years, they expect you to say something profound about <laughs> So what, you know, you've been doing this now for two decades, and what do you, you know, what, you know, what has surprised you about this industry, he asked me. And I said, and I was reminded, I don't know why it popped into my head, but there was, um, Rod Stewart got a, a Lifetime Achievement Award, and he started his speech by walking up and saying, I can't believe I've been doing this for this long. <laughs> and then he paused and added, and getting away with it. <laughs> so, um, and sometimes I feel that way. It's like it doesn't feel like a job to me at all. So um, this is a special book, Cain and Abe, for a lot of reasons. Um, you know, this is, uh, let me see if I can get this to work. We'll skip that one. Um, this isn't my first novel with a backdrop of Florida's sugar cane industry. By the way, the, the, t the title Cain and Abe has nothing to do with Cain and Abel from the, the Bible. Um, the, it's just a pun. Cain is Florida's sugar cane, um, and Abe is Abe Beckham, the lawyer who gets mixed up in the case that's, um, that uh, is discussed and uh, in, is, is the focus of the, the plot. Um, 25 years ago, um, I read a, a book called um, Big Sugar, by, and it was written by a reporter for The New Yorker uh, who had done sort of this investigative reporting job of uh, Belle Glade, Clewiston, those kind of places. Um, and it was sort of a follow-up to, as you can see from the, the, uh, the slide here, um, Edward Murrow did a, a, a documentary called Harvest of Shame in the 1960s, which sort of gave the sugar industry its first black eye about um, the way it harvests sugarcane, which is sort of stoop labor, basically. You know, it's, it's, you know, men with machetes out in the field for long hours toiling in the sun um, for not much pay. Uh, and uh, I thought, you know, I wanted to have uh, a Florida-based novel, but one that wasn't just about 
you know, the latest restaurant in South Beach or th that sort of thing. I wanted something about Florida that people wouldn't necessarily associate with Florida. So I started writing um, a novel uh, about, with the, it was a multi-family, it was a multi-generational family saga set partly in Palm Beach, partly in Miami, involving lawyers, involving the sugarcane industry. Um, and I spent about three years writing that. And the scariest thing about that novel was that I was working for a law firm at the time. And about in the middle of my writing of that, we started representing the sugar industry, <laughs> which was a pretty awkward situation because um, at that time, there wasn't a lot being written very favorable about um, the sugar industry. Uh, and uh, it's, at that time, they were using all immigrant workers called under the H-2 program. They were Jamaicans, Dominicans, Haitians. Uh, and there was a lot of controversy growing and growing about the way they were treating the workers. Um, so uh, I kind of, at that point, was very glad I had adopted two rules for writing my novel. One was to keep it fun, but the second rule proved to be even more prophetic, and that was to keep it a secret. Because <laughs> I didn't want you know, the senior partner of a law firm to come into the firm, the, I, my office and say, well, what are you working on, Grapando? And it's like, oh, well, chapter 22 of my you know, harpooning of the sugar industry. So, uh, so this went on for about two and a half years, um, and uh, I finally got an, um, an agent interested in that novel, um, and uh, a couple now, a couple of them rejected it right out of hand. Um, Ludlum's agent rejected it. John Grisham's agent rejected that novel. Um, in fact, they did more than rejected it. They uh, Ludlum's agent declared it terminally obese. Uh, <laughs> uh, so. Uh, you got to get a, th a thick skin in this industry. Uh, so, uh, and he was right, though, because I had spent three years writing this sugar story um, and with really not much of a filter. Uh, I had been, uh, you know, every tidbit I had picked up in a cocktail party had found its way into the dialogue. Every, I had like three or four lead characters, you know, I had about five or six plots going on in this. And, um, I, it was Grisham's agent who told me, look, you know, your first novel should be no more than 90,000 words. And I went back and did the word count function on my, sh my sugar story, and it was 265,000 <laughs> words long. Um, <laughs> it was a monster in a box. Um, but I, I got a call from a guy named Artie Pine who liked the story, thought the back drop of the whole sugar industry was very interesting um, and asked me to cut that down to a marketable length and he would agree to represent me and I thought that was a really fair deal since it was the only offer I had literally <laughs> I had I had written to about two dozen agents at this point in time um, and in back then there was you know of course no self-publishing option really except vanity press which was truly you know that's there was a reason they called it vanity press uh, it was there wasn't really it wasn't a commercially viable kind of option it was just if you wanted to see your your story between the boards so to speak um, you could just you know just pay for it and get it published so um, so Artie encouraged me to rewrite and rework my sugar story um, and uh, I have here up on the screen, you probably can't read it, and I don't really want to read it because there's nothing. Actually, there is a few good things in there. Um, that's the last rejection letter I got from <laughs> Dell Publishers um, on the sugar story, which already delivered to me in August of 1992. Um, and essentially, I'll paraphrase the rejection letter for you. It was, Something along the lines of the characters are rich, the story is multi-layered. Unfortunately, we are entering an era of minimalist writing. Um, and, and I think what she meant by that was that, um, do you remember when you would read a book and it would strike you as odd that the entire chapter was only three quarters of a page long? Um, and, and, 
which now that's not unusual at all. You know, it's all about white space, I guess, is to k give you that feeling that the pages are turning. So I didn't write it that way. That This book was not part of what that, um, and already uh, represented um, a writer who was sort of leading the way towards this, what, sh what this e editor referred to as minimalist writing. He represented James Patterson. And it was before Patterson really hit it big. I can still remember the first time I went to Artie's office. He had um, on the wall, uh, probably uh, it was a, this foam board about six feet tall and three feet wide. And um, it was a reproduction of the New York Times bestseller list. And now this is before the day when you could just do this on your own. You had to really go and hire somebody to create this, a reproduction. And at number one in the New York Times bestseller list was James Patterson's Along Came a Spider. And, and I said to Artie, I didn't know Jim had made number one New York Times bestseller. And Artie said, he hasn't. He created this board for his editor and for his agent and had it shipped to their office and said, this is where we're going. Um, so, and he wasn't wrong. Um, so, but in any event, um, this didn't, this sugar novel didn't fit the model for what they were looking for. And for a lot of reasons, it got rejected. So, um, so Artie decided that I should try again, even though it had been three and a half years of my life had been invested in this story and it had been rejected by basically everyone. I mean, his words to me, I had knocked on every door in New York City and I'm sorry, nobody wants your book, um, which was pretty discouraging. On top of that, consider the timing. Who here was living in uh, Miami in August of 1992? Okay, so yeah, almost everybody here. That's pretty amazing. So you know, that was, that was Andrew who had whipped through here and literally, you know, Tiffany, who I had not, we weren't even engaged at that point. We'd started dating in May um, of 92. It's August 92. Her house was destroyed with her parents' house. Their grandmother lived with them. So they all moved in with me and were living in a two-bedroom townhouse with no air conditioning. And that was, that was, that was literally the timing of when I got the call from Artie saying, you know, I couldn't sell it. I'm really sorry. So, um, but he encouraged me to do it again, which, you know, think about that. And I, when I talk to school kids about this, they think, you got to be kidding, right? You actually tried again after three and a half years of writing a novel and getting just nothing to show for it. I've got this novel sitting in a drawer next to my socks to show for it. Um, and, uh, but I already said, you know, and he goes back to that letter that I showed you where it had some kind things to say in it. He said, you know, Jim, you got the most encouraging rejection letters I have ever seen. <laughs> Which sounded kind of silly, but it was, his point was that you had this sugar story that was broken, 265,000 word monster in a box and you tried to fix it. Just start over. Start with a, you know, page one, chapter one, and it'll be a totally different result. Um, so, uh, so I did. And sometimes an idea does hit you like the lightning bolt that I have up there. Okay. And, um, but sometimes um, it doesn't rain or the lightning doesn't come for a very long time. <laughs> but, it, and in fact, I went for two months of, um, I thought the whole idea of writer's block was a complete myth. I really did. I didn't think it existed. I thought it was, you know, something people, it was a crutch that people made up for because they weren't working hard enough. Um, but I had writer's block after Artie and I agreed that I was going to start all over again. And um, so I spent two months, basically this was my life. I would get up about 6.30, get into the office about 7.30, was practicing law at a very large firm at this time. And uh, I'd stay till about eight o'clock at night. 
And then I would see my friends have dinner and I'd start writing about 10 and maybe write till about midnight. Well, that's how I produced the sugar story that was 265,000 words long, but that's also how I operated for the next two months and had absolutely nothing, nothing. Blank white sheet of paper at the end of the night. Um, and, uh, and I think it was because I had this uh, fear that I was going to start down that wrong road again. And then I'd be eight years into this, and I'd have two manuscripts in my drawer next to my socks with nothing to show for it. And I didn't want to be that person. So um, until October of 92, in October of 92, um, I uh, was doing my usual routine. And it was about 1 in the morning, and I decided some of you have heard the story before, but I've, I'm, I'll tell it again anyway. But um, I got about, I went for a walk about one in the morning, and I got about two blocks from my house. And um, a police car pulls up, and the police car drives up onto the grassy part of the swale. He jumps out of the car, and he demands to know, where are you going? And I could have gotten on, being a lawyer, I could have gotten on the civil rights soapbox really quickly. But I didn't because it was one in the morning and I had to go to work in about five and a half hours. And I thought, well, uh, officer, I am out for a walk and I live around here. And he didn't seem to believe that I lived around there. So he said, well, do you have any identification? Um, and I told him the truth. Again, now this is really pushing the limit on the civil rights issue. You know, stopping someone for no reason, demanding identification. Um, but I was polite and said the truth, which was, no, I'm, I'm, and I was dressed for bed, dragging shorts, t-shirt. I don't have my wallet. I have no identification. And he said, well, I need you to wait right here because there's been a report of a peeping Tom in the neighborhood. <laughs> so uh, I'm thinking, um, great. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, I've got a so I'm just hoping this is going to be a waste of time and not something more than a waste of time. Um, but I'm listening to the radio dispatcher describe the peeping Tom that they're looking for. And mind you, this is like 20 years ago. She says, and she says, she says that they're looking for a white male, uh, under six feet tall, brown hair, brown eyes, uh, around 30 years old. I'm thinking, this sounds pretty familiar. Uh, <laughs> w wearing a white t-shirt. I had on a white t-shirt dark blue shorts, I had on dark blue shorts, and I'm thinking, I'm going to jail, uh, <laughs> you know? Um, and finally, she adds, and a mustache, yeah. okay? So um, the cop looks at me, like maybe he had a phony mustache and he ripped it off, or maybe in the shadows, the, someone thought he had a mustache, and we probably didn't look at each other all that long, but it felt like forever for, to me because um, I'm waiting for him to tell me to go home. And finally, he says, go home. So he saw something, whatever it was, the lack of a mustache or whatever it was. But as he's <laughs> driving away, I'm thinking to myself, but for a mustache, I'd be in the back of that car. And I would have to be 1.30 in the morning, and I would have to call the senior partner at Steele, Hector, and Davis, the law firm and tell them, um, yes, I'm downtown at the station. Yeah, you heard it right, uh, peeping Tom, OK? And, uh, and they would have no, you know, it was a nice group of people, but they would not have much of a sense of humor about being, because I'd be in the paper, right? It would be Steele, Hector, and Davis lawyer arrested as peeping Tom, and I would forever be the peeping Tom lawyer. It would stick, right? And maybe I'd be vindicated somewhere down the line because you know, I mean, really, when, you, when you're watching the news at night and you see that person shoved into the back of the squad car is your first reaction, oh, look, honey, there goes another innocent man off to jail, you know? <laughs> um, your reaction is probably, he did it. Or if he didn't do this, uh, he was probably doing something. Um, or maybe even... Well, if he wasn't doing something this time, he's probably done a whole lot of other things in his life, and that's why he's in this situation. Um, it's very difficult to completely, completely clear your name from something like this. 
So um, I decided I was going to go home and write about this. And so I did. I did what I do now as a thriller writer, and I write, I take a feeling that's real to me, and I take it to a dramatic extreme. And in this case, I took this feeling of being innocent and accused and imagined, I had done some death penalty work at this point in my career, and I imagined a man on death row hours away from execution for a murder he may not have committed. And I wrote the opening scene of a novel I called The Pardon, um, and I already sold it in a weekend, uh, and I wrote it in seven months, uh, and it's now in 26 languages, still in print all over the world. So, um, so happy ending. Now, um, so that takes me 22 novels later. Um, you know, people kept asking me, and probably if I didn't answer this question now, you would ask, well, whatever happened to that? manuscript, that sugar manuscript that you had sitting there? Well, the answer is there was a very good reason it was not published. Uh, actually, there are probably about two dozen good reasons why it was not published. There was a lot of flaws with it, and I went back to it, and Artie and I talked about it, and we just declared it, uh, you know, we decided that, uh, that um, uh, Ludlum's agent was absolutely correct. It was terminally obese, so rest in peace. So, um, but I didn't want to drop the idea of the sugar industry. I still felt like that story had potential. Um, and so I needed a narrator, though, for this story. And this was the first idea I came up with for a narrator. Now, the first, last living American slave, this sort of idea kept percolating in my head. Um, the last living American slave, was Sylvester McGee, who, if you can read the tombstone, died in, he died in 1971. Yeah. Now, there is some discrepancy about his actual birth date. This says he would be 130 years old. Uh, okay. Um, so, uh, we don't think that's accurate. But, um, but it is a fact. He was a slave, uh, and he died in 1971, and they couldn't find anybody else who was still alive at the time, who had ever been a slave. Um, so, you know, maybe he was a, a young boy when he was a slave, but in any event, this idea of the last um, living American slave was very interesting to me, um, especially since, you know, uh, they had abolished slavery in 1865. Probably you haven't thought about the 13th Amendment of the United States Constitution very often in your life because it just, it just sounds like, okay, they decided that 150 years ago that there was no slavery, and why would there be any reference to um, the 13th Amendment anymore? Um, so, well, the truth is, I, you know, again, I had done a lot of research on the sugar industry. Um, and so, uh, a very interesting fact, back in the 40s, um, there was sort of a recruitment campaign going on uh, by the sugar growers in Florida, and they would go up to places like Memphis or Jackson, Mississippi, passing out these leaflets that would say uh, to, uh, and they would target all African American candidates. Um, enjoy the Florida sunshine during the winter months while harvesting sugar cane on the plantations of the U.S. Sugar Corporation. It sounds like a, a camp, right? Uh, <laughs> Uh, offering good wages, $30 a week, free rent, free meals, free ride to Florida, free medical attention, and even, you know, fun in the sun recreation, right? So that was the, that was the pitch. That was the pitch. Um, and they would get these guys to come on the, um, on the trucks, and they would ride down to Florida. And the, as soon as they got off the truck in Clewiston, they were handed a bill. And that free ride to from Memphis cost them 11 bucks. They were charged 75 cents for a blanket, 50 cents for a machete, and this is another one I really, I love. <laughs> 35 cents if you want it sharpened, okay? So, so, so you can actually do your job. Um, a dollar uh, for a badge that would identify you as an employee of the U.S. Sugar Corporation, um, and 50 cents for water that wasn't too dirty to drink. So, uh, and it kind of went on and on from there. The basic idea here was that the moment these guys set foot on Florida soil, they were trapped 
because the only way to work your way out of this debt was to cut sugarcane. Um, and working your way out of debt was pretty difficult because <laughs> um, it was a long day, number one, 4.30 a.m. until dark. Um, and their wages were $1.80 a day when they were promised almost $6 a day wages. So, uh, and of course, you know, every time you didn't, you know, you, you had recurring expenses, you know, the machete would get dull, so it would be another 50 cents to sharpen your machete. You'd get thirsty, so you'd have to buy some more water. Um, uh, and kind of the creepiest component of it was the superintendents who patrolled the fields, where, you know, it was uh, very reminiscent of uh, slavery, basically. I mean, they're, they're armed guards with pistols to keep guys from running away from the plantations and heading back to Memphis or Jackson or Atlanta or wherever without paying their debts. So um, I'm not making this up, by the way. This is, this is not part of the novel. This is part of the historical research. So, um, so the reason I flashed the 13th Amendment to the Constitution is because um, not a lot of indictments are brought in this country under the 13th Amendment to the Constitution. Um, but in 1941, there was an indictment of U.S. Sugar Corporation by a federal grand jury in Florida um, and their, some of their employees for consp uh, conspiracy to violate the right and privilege of citizens to be free from slavery under the 13th Amendment. Um, and like I said, you, it just, when, you, when I saw that document, it just struck me as so bizarre to me that um, in the 20th century, a century I lived in, um, uh, actually, you know, not, not that much, uh, just less than two decades before I was born, a major U.S. company was indicted uh, for enslaving uh, its em employees. So... Um, so if you'll read Cain and Abe, um, the last living American slave actually is, he's not the narrator. I decided he couldn't be the narrator, couldn't tell the story the way I wanted to tell it. Um, but he's in the story as a character because I've made him one of these men who was um, taken, brought down from Memphis in 1941. So Luther Vine is still alive in the book. He's the last living American slave. Um, I have friends who think I should have called the book The Last Living American Slave, but that's a marketing decision, I guess. So um, fast forward a little bit on the industry, and then I'll get to the story a little bit, is um, uh, a, lot, a lot has changed in the sugar industry. Uh, first of all, they don't use, there's no, uh, at least in the United States, um, it's not harvested by hand anymore. It's all done by machine. Um, but one interesting aspect of the sugar harvest um, that has not changed for decades and decades is the burning of the sugar cane uh, fields. Um, and I don't know if you've ever, has anybody er ever driven past the Everglades when they're burning the sugar cane? Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, it kind of smells like burnt corn or something almost. Yeah. It's, it's got this very distinct smell. Um, and. Uh, and, you know, as the research, as I write in the book, the, uh, no one really knows how that was discovered, but you actually can flash burn the field. It clears away the brush and it makes it easier to harvest it. Now, whether you're doing it by hand or by machine, either way, it makes it more interesting. So, um, but I thought that was an interesting sort of component. And so I've wanted to use that. So I've got Luther, the, the last living American slave. I've got the burning of the sugar cane fields. Um, so I've got a, you know, all these little things kind of loosely going around in my head as to how I'm going to do it. So, um, and I had this other character named Victoria Santos from an earlier book that a lot of people, I keep in touch with my readers a lot through Facebook, through emails and everything, and they wanted, you know, you should bring her back, you should bring her back. And Victoria Santos was sort of a, sort of like a, um, oh, who's the, why am I drawing a blank on the actress's name who played the FBI agent in The Silence of the Lambs? Foster. Yeah, Foster. Jody, Jody Foster. Foster. Okay, yeah. It was kind of a, that kind of a character. She was a young um, woman who worked in the behavioral science unit, what was then called behavioral science unit of the uh, FBI. And people wanted her to come back. So I brought her back in this book, investigating a series of killings 
in which the bodies are dumped in the Everglades in the sugarcane fields that have, after the burnings have taken place, um, and some of the bodies are burned in the sugarcane burnings, which you know uh, destroys the evidence and so forth. So it's a very difficult case. Um, and uh, the other aspect to it that um, ties in with the sugar industry is that, um, is that the method that this killer is using harkens back to this old days of when these machete-wielding men were cutting sugar cane by hand in the field. Now, um, this is not a serial killer book. I want to tell everyone that right. It really, it's, this is more of a backdrop of it. I really see the story. We'll, uh, you'll see where the story is going. Um, one more thing about this, because I just, it's, some of you might have trouble getting an image in your head of what the sugar cane cutters look like. Um, but that's sort of the, that's the getup they had, is this big, big old knife. Um, they have the, sh the metal shin guards on, the knee pads, the, uh, the metal uh, coverings on their feet, big gloves on their hands. Um, and they kind of look like um, black gladiators, you know, walking out into, this, into the fields when they, when, they, um, when they step out to do their job. Um, so Abe is, um, this is the Abe part of the cane and Abe. Um, this goes back to a little bit of write what you know. Um, and uh, when, when Abe, uh, Abe is a widower. Um, and I started writing this novel when my sister died in a car accident. Um, and I was kind of very close to my brother-in-law and he was getting his life back together again. And uh, so uh, Abe is having a very hard time getting over the death of his wife. Um, and right about the time he's getting his life back together again, he's remarried uh, and uh, things seem to be going his way. He's called in to monitor the investigation of this Cutter is what they named the killer, um, who is um, kind of terrorizing South Florida at this point. Abe's wife goes missing. His new wife goes missing. Um, and naturally, you would think, oh my God, this poor man. You know, his first wife dies of cancer. Now he's investigating this serial killer in South Florida, and his new wife goes m missing. Um, but then you start to learn more about. Abe, and this is why I said this is really not a serial killer book. It's really more about, uh, it's a marital drama, I think, more than that, in the sense that, because then you learned about, well, Abe's new life with his new wife really wasn't all that perfect. Um, uh, and uh, some people would say it was because he couldn't get over his first wife, um, but others had a new theory which is that Abe has his dark side. And this is becoming a little too coincidental. Abe's wives, you know, he, he keeps losing his wives to these seemingly tragic circumstances. Um, so is he a Scott Peterson kind of type of a character? Or is he someone we should really feel sorry for of trying to get his life together? So I think it's sort of a, that's where the, this is where it's become interesting is that the critics have compared it to Gone Girl and presumed innocent. And the thing I like about those stories and that I think is accurate about that comparison, not that I'm elevating myself to those sort of iconic books, but um, it's this idea of an unreliable narrator. And I mentioned earlier that the, it didn't work for the story to be told through Luther, the last living American slave. Um, it needed to be told through Abe. And I told it in first person. Um, which gives it an immediacy to the story, but just as in um, Gone Girl or Presumed Innocent, there comes a point in the story where it's like, can I really trust what this person is telling me? Is this really the whole story? Is there something they're hiding? Um, which is kind of a fun way to write a book. Um, and this story told itself very quickly for me. I wrote it in about four months. Um, the last part of it I was gonna talk about uh, but I think we'll take some questions instead. There is, a, there is this ongoing war between sugar and the Everglades. That is also was an interesting part of it. And I did a lot of research on that and did, 
and send the fertilizer, the runoff, and so forth uh, that um, uh, creates problems for, uh, you know, all kind of problems for the Everglades. So, but there's not much of that in the book. It's just, this is another, I guess, this is the last thing I'll say about this before we, we take questions, is that one of the th difficult things, and one of the things I obviously learned, you take that 265,000 word manuscript and you realize, and it's, and it's because you spend time researching something, you feel like you got to put it in. It's got to go in, right? I can't, I waste, I can't, I spent two weeks researching this. It's got to go in. And we've all read those novels where it's like, you know, good God. It's like, why is this in the story? And you just realize it's because the author did all the research and it's, it's by God, it's going in there, you know? So, um, I did a lot of time researching the environmental aspect of this. It's pretty much non-existent in the book because it doesn't have anything to do with the story. So um, the happy news is, is that uh, I've matured, I guess, since after 20 <laughs> years. And I've learned that you know, some things do belong on the cutting room floor. So, um, so that is, that's it for, yeah, that's it. So, are there any, any questions we want to take? So, thank you. So, by the way, that's my family in the back row there. So, yeah, so anybody, anybody who follows me on Facebook has seen the pictures of uh, my beautiful dancing daughter, Kaylee, who's here from Seattle. She dances with Pacific Northwest Ballet. Uh, and a professor and of mathematics. Yeah, Ains Ainsley, yes. So, yeah. Um, did you have a question? What is your day like now that you're not a Well, um, that's a good question because it varies uh, tremendously depending on um, um, where I am in the writing process. Uh, she wanted to know what my, my day is like now that I'm not a trial lawyer. I do, I do practice law. I don't go to court. So, so that kind of keeps my, that schedule, that part of the schedule manageable. Um, but uh, you know the last uh, seven eight months have been crazy because uh, uh, Black Horizon came out last March, uh, Cain and Abe is this January, Cash Landing comes out June second. I have a novella called The Penny Jumper ca coming out in October, and and then I just finished. Um, uh, a book called Return to Justice, which is the Jack Switek number 12, which will probably be out the winter of 2016. So, so that's been really, this is the busiest I've ever been. And I billed a thousand hours of law last year. So, I mean, so it's really so been, Steel Hector, I mean, Steel Hector is no more. So yeah, that was, um, which um, I'm sad about in one respect. And the other respect, um, I get a kind of an I told you so to my mother because I stopped practicing law uh, in, in uh, September of 96. Kaylee was born in July of 96. And my mother thought I'd flip my lid. You know, what are you doing? You're quitting your job. You're having a baby. And to this day, she still breaks my life down into two, two chapters. One is when Jimmy had a job and the other is when he does this. So. Um, so, but to, to get back to your question about Steel Hector, is that Steel Hector and Davis is defunct. So, and I'm still writing, so, um, so, so that's good, yeah, yeah. When you start a book, do, do you outline the story from start to finish before you start writing, or do you do it as you go? Uh, this is a process question, yeah. So, uh, I do, out, I, my plots are, on the complex side. Um, so there's a lot going on in my books. Um, so I do an outline, um, but I have found that, and I didn't really get to this point till I was at, on my fifth or sixth book. I only, I outline only to the point of conflict in the book where, you know, good clashes with evil, bad guy meets good guy, whatever. Uh, because I found that if I had outlined all the way to the resolution that the writing was very contrived because I was writing to a specific ending. In fact, I'm just having this discussion now with my editor. She feels one of the characters is underdeveloped. Um, and I 
explained to her just today before I came here is that um, the reason she's underdeveloped is because I didn't know if she was going to be the the bad guy, you know, at the end. I'd really and so I didn't really know how to develop her. So I have to wait and see which way the story kind of takes me. So now I'll fill in some things. So, and that works really well for me. My outlines are pretty extensive. I mean, when I say an outline, it's not you know Roman numeral one A B C. It's it's more of a Reader's Digest version of the story, and uh, uh, and it can be anywhere. The longest I think I ever did a book called Money to Burn. Uh, it was a financial thriller. Uh, and I think because of the subject matter, that ended up being like an 80-page outline for me, um, which is a lot when you consider, I mean, a book is 300, right? I've got it figured out. For those of, if anybody's listening uh, uh, who's a writer, basically if you do one and a half spacing and 12-point type, it's pretty much a one-to-one -one ratio. So, you know, so I know now if I have 300 pages of manuscript, it's going to be 300 pages of a book. So... Yeah. Who do you read? Um, pretty much now I read uh, whatever my kids are reading in school so that I can talk to them about that, okay. which is an interesting thing. I think, e I think if, you don't, if you don't even do, if you don't, even if you don't have children that are reading the books that you read when you were in middle school or high school, I really recommend that you go back and read those books that you thought were the greatest books for whatever reason back then and it's a really interesting experience to kind of uh, kind of take it from there so um, yeah yeah so um, so I did bring a box of books so and I really think it's important to um, to support um, bookstores like books and books um, because every time I release a novel I go to a city that you know, where has a was in last and, and was with in Pittsburgh with Kaylee and went to a, what used to be a great bookstore and it's gone. You know, and so we're very very lucky to have um, a, an independent bookstore like Books and Books. So I ask you to support it, and I know you can go buy the book cheaper on Amazon. So so, but support the book uh, bookstore and. To induce you to do that, I'm giving you a free paperback from my personal stash if you buy the book here from Books and Books. So, um, so thanks for coming. Oh. Yeah. All right, folks. So if there are no more questions, then a quick reminder for our internet audience watching at home. There's still plenty of time for you to call the number on your screen. Uh, you can purchase a copy of Cain and Abe. We will have James sign that for you, and we'll ship it to wherever you are in the United States free of charge. Also, a reminder that all of our live streamed events are archived. So if you don't get a chance to watch them live, you could go to the Books and Books website, go to the live streaming link, and any author appearance that we broadcast from here at the store will be saved there for you to watch at your convenience. So for those of you here in the house, as James mentioned, we have Cain and Abe for sale at the counter over there. And as a complimentary gift, he'll be giving you a free Grappando paperback to go along with that. He'll be signing at the table to the right of the screen. Let's please give James Grappando another hand. Thanks very much. Thank you, James. <laughs>